Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you welcome. happen to be. Welcome, yes, welcome. That, I guess that works <laughs> universally regardless of the time of day. Um, this is Implementing Entity Framework with uh, MVC. Uh, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. Very happy today to be joined by uh, Adam Tuliper. Hello, so, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. If you want to introduce yourself, Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Tuliper, a technical evangelist out of Southern California. Uh, I love technology. That's why I have the Geek Cup there. And uh, <laughs> I love web, data, gaming, kind of any technology I can get my hands on, which... Uh, allows, you know, as time allows. Um, I was a software architect for many years before joining Microsoft. Uh, I work with a whole bunch of folks across the board from enterprise to startups. Uh, check me out on Twitter, Adam Tuliper, and yeah. have an awesome day today. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Uh, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. I'm a uh, content developer here at, uh, at Microsoft. I'm a uh, longtime Microsoft certified trainer um, who uh, finally made the move to, uh, to Microsoft about uh, eight months ago, which is uh, pretty freaky. Um, I still miss my uh, Commodore 64, best operating system ever. Um, and um, uh, if I'm not playing with technology, I'm spending time with my wife, my dog, or an eye on, and we'll do our best to try and answer uh, every question that uh, that we possibly uh, possibly can. Um, now, uh, we're also going to be doing all of our demos, for the most part, live, um, which does mean that something's going to go wrong. Inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Something will go wrong. Here's our apology. Uh, but you are going to notice that you can go grab the uh, demo files as, as well as the slides at that uh, GitHub repository right there. I will mention that as of right now, uh, you're going to notice there's no code yet because we haven't built any code yet. That's, that's what we're going to be doing here today. So you can uh, follow that link. And uh, don't worry, we'll be putting that into the chat window over and over and over again today. Uh, now, as far as what it is that we're going to talk about, um, we've got uh, six modules. So we'll be here till about 4 o'clock uh, Pacific, uh, give or take. And uh, Adam, what are you going to talk about to start? Because you're doing module one. Today, so give me the opportunity to nap. I'm going to talk about introduction to Entity Framework, kind of an overall architecture of it and what it is. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to pick up with uh, module two, uh, getting in, taking a look at uh, code first, how to design your classes, how to build up that uh, data context, roll on into module three, talking about uh, managing relationships. And in both of those modules, I'm going to kind of introduce the basics of working with the database behind the scenes. But in module four, you're going to talk more about that. I am. I'm going to talk about using what's called the Fluent API in Entity Framework mm -hmm. and how that can be used to manage your database. Uh, and then some one of my favorite uh, features and technology in general is uh, database migrations, code first migrations, which is an amazing way to manage your database uh, and keep it in sync with your code. OK, excellent. And by the way, I will say for those of you who've done um, uh, Entity Framework in the past, chances are migrations is something that you've uh, struggled a little bit with. Um, I know that I have in the past. Uh, definitely uh, something you want to check out. So uh, definitely tune in for, uh, for module four there. Module five, I'm going to pick it up with uh, managing uh, transactions and uh, also dealing with a web environment that, again, we're going to be using MVC as our, uh, as our client. Uh, and so whenever you send something down that's disconnected, how are we going to get it back in? How are we going to manage uh, transactions? So we'll talk about all of that. And then we'll close it all off with uh, Module 6, which Adam is going to talk about. What are you going to talk about? That's kind of a, a good mishmash of all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. cool tips and tricks and ways to make your applications better. We're going to talk about how to integrate stored procedures into your applications with Enemy yep. Framework. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to build upon what you're doing with concurrency in Module 5 and show you an amazing way to basically uh, show users on a website what changed values. Mm -hmm. You know, you hit a web page, you hit save. Uh-oh, something's changed in the database. Allow users to compare their versions of the web pages. Uh, we're going to look a little bit forward in what's coming in Entity Framework 7 as well. OK. I love it. I love it. Now, let's talk a little bit about you, the viewer, and uh, kind of talk about what we're expecting as far as your experience goes. And I do want to highlight that really what we're expecting um, is that you are a developer. Um, we are going to be using MVC here. But we're not 
focused on MVC. We are going to be using MVC as the front end. We are going to talk about web-specific scenarios. But I would say the bulk of what we're going to be talking about is true kind of universally, that regardless of where you're using Entity Framework, what we're going to be talking about would apply there. Um, I would so, agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not an MVC developer, there's still quite a bit that, uh, that you can glean from this. Um, we are expecting, of course, that you have experience with C Sharp. If you've played around with um, Entity Framework in the past, then hopefully this will help uh, answer some questions uh, fill in some gaps for you. And then uh, if you are looking for kind of more information on uh, MVC in general, uh, we do have an MVA uh, on MVC that uh, John Galloway and I did. Just go in and do a real quick search for uh, MVC and you'll be able to uh, find that pretty quickly. All right, well, enough of the intros. How about we actually get into it? Let's take it away. All I right. do have one, one off-topic thing to say. You're uh -oh. You guys were Commodore 64 guys. I just have to put out there. I was an Atari 800 XL guy. All right. And it makes me wonder. I've got I've got a zero. We just had a baby a month ago, so I've got a zero, two, and four year old. And, and I wonder like what their initial technology is going to be. You know, if they're mm. going to be older like us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be like, oh, I remember my, you know, whatever. I have my is it my phone, my tablet, my computer. Yeah, it's that's actually a really good question. Yeah, <laughs> they, they'll remember their Lumia 1020. That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> they, they have to hold the two hands and. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's basically like a like a laptop to them. <laughs> oh, yeah, the uh, 1520, the 1020. Oh, well, that's. Oh, yeah, yeah, the 1520. The yeah, definitely. 1520. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my son would be like that with it. <laughs> I love All right. It. So let's get rolling with the introduction to Entity Framework, shall we? Yeah. Uh, this module is going to be talking about the architecture from kind of a high-level view, what Entity Framework is uh, made up of. We're going to look at a very basic intro to code first, because uh, Christopher is going to be taking away and running with that in module two, and then how we can generate Entity Framework classes. I will be doing a little bit of a demo in a console app, a little bit of a demo in an MVC app. Um, I think what you said really holds true. Most of what we're going to do is uh, Probably 95.872% is going to be... Uh, two. Yeah, that's right. Yep. <laughs> two, two, two. A repeating, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two over <laughs> the, the line over the top. Yep. Yeah, that's usable <laughs> across the various technologies. Okay, so let's get started with architecture of Entity Framework. First off, what is the Entity Framework? Entity Framework is an ORM. <laughs> okay, what, what's an ORM? What's an ORM? So an ORM, Object Relational Mapper, maps your database types Mm -hmm. over to your code types. Well, what does that mean? Well, in your table, you have a customer table, and you want to take that to a customer class in your database. Now, as we write applications, we use this repetitive code over and over again. We kind of do the same thing, but the only thing we're changing might be a table name and a class with different properties. We used to write um, programs, you know, code generator programs that would generate this code for you, and we did it all the time. So why do that? Why not have something that handles transactions, that can do all this for you, allow you to give you a way to query this? Entity Framework also allows you to even take multiple tables and have them go to one single class or vice versa. So it's really full-featured. It allows you to support many different platforms. Uh, Entity Framework 6.1, which is what we'll be using for uh, almost everything today, or Entity Framework 6 Plus, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, will work in any project that is uh, full .NET 4 Plus. And this will work with all of Microsoft SQL databases, and I mean by that we'll say, uh, let's say SQL CE, SQL Azure, mm -hmm. SQL Express, uh, local DB, and you can use it in a variety of the application templates out there. So if you're doing, uh, we're talking about MVC today, you could do web forms, WPF, WCF, Web API. Um, there are some newer ones that Entity Framework 7 is going to support. Uh, there's some really cool stuff on the Entity Framework blog. We'll talk about that at the very end of the day. But that includes uh, some future support for Agile ta 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 Table Storage. Easy Getting for you to say. Tongue tied today. <laughs> uh, including various platforms, like being able to run uh, Entity Framework on, on uh, OS X and Linux. So some really exciting things coming down the uh, pipe there. Nice. Now, supported providers here. If you're kind of curious what other uh, database engines support Entity Framework, because I've been in, in many enterprise environments where we use many different database types, mm -hmm. uh, over on MSDN, they kind of list a couple of the ADO.NET providers, which these ones work. All of these providers listed here include Entity Framework support, and you can see there's a ton of them, MySQL, Oracle, all the way down the line. Basically, if, 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 if there's a database that you're using, chances are Entity Framework will work with Yes. It. Yeah. So have no fear. <laughs> <laughs> And, and if it doesn't currently work with it, EF7 will probably pick up support. EF7 probably will, or there's probably some open source project where somebody's written another provider for it somewhere. Uh, yep. The open source community is pretty strong around Entity Framework as well. Uh, Entity Framework is also open source now as well. Yep. Uh, they do accept community contributions on there, so if you've got some really cool ideas, uh, 
submit yeah. it to the team. You can check that out at GitHub. So I've got a couple supported features here. This is by no means whatsoever a complete list because I could probably write a, a couple pages of these. Just These are some of the things I wanted to point out, some of them we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the most important thing is Entity Framework is a essentially a full-featured ORM, and that will take your stuff in your database and map it to your code and vice versa. So we can go from that customer table to our customer class. Mm -hmm. As a simplest form, we can make that more complicated. Um, table names don't have to match. <coughs> classes don't have to match. Allows now async is such a big thing in uh, in the .NET world nowadays. Yeah. So we can do, uh, has full support for asynchronous queries. Connection resiliency, which we're going to be talking about in the last module, how to retry on connection failures. Stored procedure mapping will also be hitting in the last module. Uh, in this module, we'll talk a little bit about reverse engineering an existing database, how to take an existing database and create some code from it. Uh, and then we're going to go the other way as well, using code to create a database and concurrency detection, which you're going to be talking quite a bit about. I'll yep. be doing a little bit on enum and spatial data support. So just a few features there. We have uh, many, many, many more supported features. So let's take a very, very, very uh, high level, <laughs> simplified view on Entity Framework here. OK. Link to entities. You're going to write some sort of query mm -hmm. using link, and that's going to use an entity framework link to entities. That is going to, uh, entity framework is going to convert that to a query behind the scenes. It's going to use your great little code syntax and figure out what the SQL statement to execute is going to be behind the scenes there. It's going to execute it and then simply map those results, if applicable, to an entity. Uh, if you were inserting something into a database, you know, if I'm inserting an album into a database, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect to get an album record back. But if I'm saying, hey, give me the album, select star from albums where ID equals one, yep. or give me the first album in the database, I would expect some entity to come back to me. Yep. So that's kind of the really simplified view. And, and so that little convert to query, that's converting it to SQL or, or PLSQL or whatever it is that it happens to be using behind the scenes for the database. Exactly. OK. Now here's a little bit more of a complicated diagram, which shows the various more complex services behind the scenes. That's everything that's coming. Everything. And a lot of these, if, if you want to uh, write some really cool add-ons to Entity Framework, there's different uh, points you can add in. There's, uh, you can do interceptors to view queries and parameters, um, logging support. There's all sorts of areas that you can plug in here. So the simplified view, which we're going to be working with uh, for just about everything today, is an easy way to understand things. So this is really all we have to concentrate on here. Mm -hmm. uh, you write some link, and you get some, <laughs> you get some results back. Yep. Installing Entity Framework is very, very easy. It does require Visual Studio 2010 or greater. And for those not using NuGet or not familiar with NuGet, uh, there's a package manager built into Visual Studio mm -hmm. that I recommend everybody use. We're going to be using it quite a bit today. And uh, we can just simply, there is a GUI for it. I prefer the console. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm old school. <laughs> You know, what's funny is I started with the GUI, and I'm slowly making that move into um, um, uh, into actually using the management console and yeah. typing out basically the PowerShell inside of there. Once you go yeah. console, you never go back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so Entity Framework comes as part of the built-in templates for uh, MVC, web forms, uh, web, AP web API. If you install identity alongside of it, and we're going to look at that, uh, you can take Entity Framework and install it near every project with just a... Uh, a line of code in that um, package manager console, and we're going to look at that as well. Yep. So uh, just a real quick NuGet primer, if you haven't touched NuGet yet, so to look at what I'm going to be doing here, a couple of these commands, we're not going to use all of them. Uh, if you want to install any package, um, there's a huge NuGet repository out there with, I don't know, probably tens of thousands or many thousands of packages, we'll say. Sure. Install dash package and whatever the package name is here. So for today, we're going to be working with Entity Framework. Uh, I will show you two other packages. Uh, from a third party that I think are uh, essential in web apps, so we're going to look at those. But install package, Entity Framework. Um, if you want to install a pre-release version of, of any package, if they've published a pre-release version, maybe a beta version of it you want to check out, you can just do a dash pre. Uninstall a package from your solution. Uh, you can even update packages. So you say, you know what, I've got Entity Framework uh, 5 in my solution, and I want to go to Entity Framework 6, in other words, the latest version. You can just update package. Um, and if you have a complex solution where you have many projects in your solution, you can update either a single solution or you can target many of them. So, 
And well, the, the one thing that I would say, for those of you that are not familiar, you'll notice that it uses a PowerShell syntax there. So it's verb dash noun. So install dash package. So verb dash noun. I would also mention 31,624 packages in, uh, in NuGet. Wow. There's, there's your trivia question for the day. Wow, that's yep. a lot. Yep. And with every package that gets deployed, an angel gets its wings. So yes. that's, that's a lot yeah, of that, that, that's all, wings. Yeah, that's a lot of wings. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's look at installing. and 63,248. <laughs> a lot of, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody told me there was going to be math today. No, let's, let's make this a quiz day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about uh, installing and managing the Enly framework binaries. So let's go over to good old Visual Studio here. And I'm going to create a new project. We'll just do... Uh, to start here, we're going to do a console application. I like that you're starting. I, see, I always love doing demos with console apps just because it's just it's it's simple. You just see the code. And let's just, just go. Basic. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Console right line. We've got just the basic references here. No entity framework over here. And so what we're going to do first is install dash package. Let's increase this font size here a little bit, just in case you can't see it. Let's go to 150%. So this window that I'm in right here, Tools, NuGet Package Manager, Package Manager Console. Okay. This is also tab completion. So install P, I hit tab, fixes up the name there, install dash package. Love it. And hit tab, and we're probably gonna get a whole bunch of results here. Look at that. So these are all of the packages out there. Part of the 31 quiz tomorrow. <laughs> part of the 31,000 out there. I mean, there's so many out there. Entity framework. That's going to pull down the package, all the binaries, install it, and we can see right here. We just got a whole bunch of stuff installed into our application here. Entity framework is now installed. If we look at our packages.config file. This lists all the packages we've installed in our application. If we look in a web application, for example, which we'll check out next, we'll see there's a lot of packages installed by default. Here we just have any framework 6.1.2, which is the absolute latest. In fact, because if I say install any framework pre, yeah, uh, 6.1.2 is the most recent released version. If I go out to the net here and I say, let's go uh, entity. Enly Framework NuGet. You can typically tell, so if I go to NuGet here for Enly Framework and I scroll down, I'll be able to see if there's any kind of pre-versions out there. So this one released on December 22nd, but before then there was a beta one and beta two. So if I happen to be on 6.1.1 and I used the pre-flag here, at that time it would have installed me the 6.1.2 beta version. Uh, there's no current beta version out there as we can see, mm -hmm. so therefore I'm not, uh, I'm not getting anything. If I want to uninstall Enly Framework, I put it un. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go. Enly Framework is now gone. Actually, I got a little thing here saying, hey, restart Visual Studio to uh, complete that uninstall. If I open my, actually, since that was the only package, my packages.config file is all gone. Mm -hmm. But let's go ahead and install that again. All right. Now, easy enough. Mm -hmm. Let's go look at a web application since we are talking web today. Now you'll notice here, there's two things. This right here is the settings for identity in a web application. We did a uh, really cool identity virtual academy about a month ago, uh, Jeremy Foster and myself. Yep. Check that out if you want to learn more about identity. If you're getting into MVC, I think that's what a must watch, and I'm not just saying that to try and draw viewers. <laughs> it's a true story. Yes. And identity was one of those things that we just kept getting asked more and more and more about. So definitely check that out. Change authentication. If I say no authentication here, and I say OK, I'm going to get a template MVC application. And if I look at my references here, there's no entity framework. Or I can just open my packages.config and notice. The web templates use all sorts of packages, Microsoft packages, even open source packages. No entity framework here. So I can do the exact same thing. Let me clear this window. And I can just use the up arrow. Since I've got some recent commands in there, you can use the up arrow, down arrow to move through them. Install package entity framework. That's been modified. Reload it. We can see entity framework 6.1.2 has been installed there. Easy enough. 
And again, the same thing to uninstall it. Super, super, super duper easy. Make sense so far? Yeah. All right, we did pre, we added uh, the package, we removed the package. That's the basics of installing them. So let's go ahead and talk about an intro to code first. Cool. So we've got the binaries in there. What do we do next? Yeah, yeah. Now that we actually downloaded and installed it, yeah, let's do some code. Code. <laughs> <laughs> code first. Uh, when I first heard code first, uh, long before I worked for Microsoft, I was like, this is kind of a weird concept. I'm, I worked uh, enterprise environment. And so you're telling me that I'm going to write code and it's going to then create my database. Uh, where I worked, it almost always went the other way around. We almost always had an existing database mm -hmm. uh, that we were making modifications to, um, or somebody designed a database. It could have been us, but we kind of almost started with the database first. Um, and so this new code first strategy, I was, I was a little confused about it first. And then I found out that uh, this actually fits in quite well. There were a couple revisions and things kind of cleaned up a bit. I mean, it's all the case with any new software, new features. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is all going to piece together how we can do new code or existing database. Now, code first simply takes your classes, your plain old CLR classes, and maps them out to your database. Um, you're going to be talking a little bit about Poco, I believe, maybe. Uh, a little bit. If yep. we're lucky. <laughs> if we're um, lucky, if I feel like it. Code first, at a very minimum, um, is just requires two things. It requires a context class and your code class. And so the context class is what's going to go between us and the database, and then the code class is, well, the code. Context class is, I consider it, uh, that's essentially the spork in any the framework. Spork. The spork. Everything, it's, <laughs> it's the multi-purpose <laughs> class. Everything you're going to do with your database, everything's going to go through that context. Love it. So the spork. <laughs> For those that don't know what a spork is, uh, it's the mixture of the spoon and the fork. I hope you've seen it at some point in time in your life. It's not used so often. Well, it's actually, I had some uh, noodle soup the other day, and I thought, I really want a spork right now. The first in my life I think I've ever thought that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our DB context class, and then the only other thing that we need is another class. So let's go ahead and look at what we can do with these classes. I'm going to go ahead and copy some of this code out. Uh, in fact, I'm going to simplify this even a little bit here. I like to create just a little code cheat sheet so we're not doing super ton on the fly. So let's look at a, a demo of doing some basic code first and scaffolding. Let's go back to a console application here. Notepad, the lazy man snippets. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and install in the framework here again. And while you're doing that in the background, somebody asked, you know, the benefits on using code first, and I think we'll sort of highlight that throughout the day. Definitely. Um, but I think the biggest thing, at least for me, is it's just it's a more natural way of, of working and doing development that, you know, having to switch back and forth between a designer and code becomes a little bit of a challenge that I can do it a lot faster, um, even re regardless of how good that designer is. I, I, I type pretty quick, and if you just keep me in code, I'm, I'm much better, I'm, I'm, I'm much more efficient there than I am with, with the designer. Um, on top of that, I always find that designers tend to do sort of odd things in the background. Um, and if it's all code, then I know exactly what happened. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're developers. We yes. think more in code. In fact, quite often when we're writing applications, what we're more apt to do is uh, write some code to do something and fake a call to the database and just return a collection of data. Right Before our database was ever implemented, uh, or before we wanted to hook up to the database, because mm -hmm. our code might not match the database, yep. we would write some stub classes. So we always kind of thought in code first. Yeah. So that's where this kind of fits in. And yep. I think it's all going to piece together as we see some of these components here. Yep. So all I've done is I paste some of that code in here. We have an album, which has an album ID, a title, and a price. Pretty simple. And then we have this context class. We can see we've got some issues here, simply because we haven't brought in our namespace. And we get our little helpful helper there using system.data to entity, bring that in and compile it, and there we go. So that works fine. Again, all we've done is install it in the framework, and we've got an mm -hmm. album class and a context class. Yep. In here, you're going to talk about context a little bit more, yep. but we just essentially have uh, an entry here for our albums using DB set. Yep. Let's go ahead and use this now. So using var context is equal to new. We always have to new up a context. Always got to create a new one. Never want to cache one, always want a new one, and always want to dispose it when you're done. That's what this using statement's for. Mm -hmm. We're going to create a new one, and once we get outside the statement, we're going to go ahead and dispose it, get rid of it. Context dot, 
Remember, this is the spork. So everything we're doing in the database is going to go through here. So we do context dot, and look at that. Voila. Context dot albums. And kind of going back to that previous question about you know why use um, uh, code first as opposed to using the designer, um, where did context albums come from? If we go back and, and look at the context, you'll notice there's an albums property that Adam added into there. That's it. You can see it right there. Yep. So context.albums happens to be a DB set, a list of potential lists in the database of yep. album. Now that I'm looking at that word, album seems weird. You ever do that? You look at a word a couple times. Yeah, and, and just album. It just yeah. seems weird. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't doesn't look like it's spelled right. Just sounds weird. Yeah. <laughs> so this right here, this is it. This is my data access code that will go to the database, and if there happens to be albums in the database, this will return all the albums. It looks pretty easy so far, right? So far. So far. Let me go ahead and run that. And. It worked. In other words, it happened and it closed itself out. So there was no error, which might leave the uh, the reader, <laughs> the watcher, to wonder, well, what happened? What happened there? Like, what database are you using? What did you do? You basically said, hey, uh, you're going to create this new context class and give me all the albums in the database. Yep. What database? Where? We'll talk about how Enemy Framework finds your database. Uh, I just want to briefly touch upon the point that what's happened right now is Enemy Framework has actually created the database for me in the back end using LocalDB. And we'll look mm -hmm. at that flow in just one second here. But let's do something like this. Let's just say albums.count. And we'll just rename this. Now here, let's go ahead and say um, console.writeline. And we're just going to spit out the count here. And we'll do console.readline, just to kind of give us a little pause. Let's F5 that. How many albums are in our database currently? As expected, there's zero. Why don't you change the font color on that real quick, just to make it a little more readable. What color would you like? Um, for the background, use white. <laughs> <laughs> and then for the screen text? Use black. There we go. And then go to um, uh, font, and then choose 12 by 16. 12 by 16. Beautiful. There you go. Look at that. Oh. Hey. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what? Just for that, an angel just got his wings. Hey. <laughs> That's why it's white. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> We're just giving angels wings today. <laughs> that's, that's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> so hit enter. We'll uh, complete this application here. So we have nothing in our database right now. OK. So we're querying the database. Uh, we'll talk about how to view those queries, what it's doing behind the scenes shortly. Uh, let's do this next. Why don't we say context.albums.add. Well, what am I adding to the database? I'm going to add a new album. OK, well, what's its value going to be? We can use an inline initializer. Mm -hmm. And we can say the album ID, we'll just give it a value here. I'm sorry, the album ID is going to be our primary key. We'll do price is equal to 999. M short for decimal. Title. What's a good album title? What's your favorite album of all time? Can we say that on the air? <laughs> um, wish. Wish? Wish. OK, so we're adding a new album. Price is 999, title is wish. And then let's go ahead and do the same thing again here. Now, if you're wondering what this shorthand syntax there is, this is pretty common in .NET. Uh, this is essentially the same as that, int. It's not like JavaScript. This is still strongly typed. It just happens to look at the right-hand side. And it sees that that actually returns an int. And the compiler makes this an int. It's just a shorthand. If this happened to be some sort of long type name, it just saves us uh, from having to type that all out. OK, so let's go ahead and we've added our context. Um, I'm sorry, we've added our album to the context. So we've told the spork, hey, uh, here's an album. The thing that we have not done is told the context to go back to the database yet. Right. Context.save changes. And you will notice there was a save changes async there. So if you were looking to do async. Async stuff. Yep. And async we'll talk about a little bit in module six. six. Let's go ahead and run this guy. We'll step through this. So I'll set a breakpoint right here. OK, so we've got count is 0, as expected. We're creating a new album. 
we saved our changes to the database. If you happen to have a version of Visual Studio that has IntelliTrace, you'll see some of the queries that happened uh, here on the right-hand side. I will show you some other ways to view the queries. So if you're running Visual Studio Community Edition, for example, I'll show you some other ways to view those queries. We'll talk about that next. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and retrieve that count. Notice that count is now one. I didn't mean to hit the number five there. Control Z, <laughs> F5. So there we go, there's our output. So we have zero entries in the database, one entry in the database. I haven't really written any sort of data access code whatsoever. I gave it a class, I gave it a context, and I just started working with it. Now that was from an absolute basic standpoint. You're saying, well, all right, great. You pretty much just got all the albums by the syntax. Uh, if you want to get a little bit more specific with this, maybe I wanted, um, Maybe I wanted the albums where the title contained wish. <laughs> there you go. Maybe somebody was searching for this on a web page or in their application. And you're just using link to write that query out. And so I'm using link. So this is a real nice, easy, readable syntax. Let me break this up just a little bit here. This letter here doesn't matter. This lambda. I'm just taking any letter, the letter doesn't matter. And if we do O dot, we look, this is actually, it's recognizing this where clause, this where syntax on this API is returning an album object. These are all the properties of an album. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, okay, well, where my album dot title dot contains wish. Run this. What I should probably have done here is we can come over to the... Um, yeah, let's go see the, the SQL that it generated. If you were Come back to that, me here. Don't want to put you on the we'll spot. We'll do I'm this. Sorry about that. <laughs> where... Ah. Let's do this. This is going to become very important. It's a very little thing. This is going to become extremely important to what we're going to do today in the web environment. So if I'm going to create a query in any framework, so for example, if I'm going to do just this without the two list, if I'm not doing anything with it, so I haven't asked for the count, um, I haven't used that result set, most of the time it doesn't actually hit the database yet until you basically tell it, hey, materialize this query for me, go ahead and run it. Right. And so by saying, I want you to take those results and convert it to a list, then it says, oh, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and execute this. Mm -hmm. So let's actually go ahead and change this just a little bit to say albums.count. So that's going to show us the number of albums that had wish on it. Exactly. Or in it, yep. Let's run that. So right now we have two entries in our database, because we've run this a couple times now. Yep. And we've just added another one to the database. We're going to run this query. And now we have three entries that match containing wish. Over on the right-hand side here, we can see the queries that got executed. And again, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to view this in a little bit more detail here. But uh, IntelliTrace does show you all those queries. You can see what any framework's doing. Um, but we'll look at it in kind of a little bit nicer view, because not everybody has IntelliTrace. Yeah, you need the ultimate edition to have uh, IntelliTrace. Hit enter on that. So I'm going to take these guys right here, copy those out. This is all well and good. This is, uh, we're using a console application here. Since this is a jumpstart entity framework with MVC, mm -hmm. I think it's probably uh, good to show a little bit of MVC here. <laughs> <laughs> but these same common sense will apply. So let's do a new project, and we'll just do another website here. OK. And while you're firing that up in, in, uh, in the background, you're just going to go in and basically kind of set up the same thing, right? Set up the same thing and yeah. scaffold it out. Yeah. So uh, while you're doing that, um, uh, real quickly, one of the questions that's come up is about reusing a, a data context and performance. That is, is it best to keep using the same data context, or is it OK to keep creating it over and over and over again? And the data context will uh, manage your connection for you. So you can basically kind of let it do its thing. But it's also using ADO.NET behind the scenes. And one of the things that ADO .NET is going to do is connection pooling. So that even though you say close or dispose, by the way, there is no difference between those two methods. I don't care what somebody tells you. There's no difference. Um, go look at, at, at the actual um, 
uh, missile code. You'll see there's no difference. Uh, but in any event, if you call close or if you call dispose, what happens is it actually just puts the connection into a pool. It doesn't close it right away. So if somebody else comes along and says, hey, I want to go to that same database, it'll pull it out of the pool. So there's no uh, performance overhead there. So using the same context or creating it over and over, unless you're having to manage something like transactions or otherwise, performance-wise, there isn't really going to be a hit there. I mean, if you can just create the context, keep using it over and over, fantastic, but there's not going to be a big performance hit or any performance hit on doing select statements over and over again with new, uh, new data contexts. Yeah. Exactly. So. Connection pooling has existed on uh, Windows systems built into the providers for, for many, many years yep. now. Yeah, uh, since like version one. Yeah. yeah. You can tweak some connection pooling parameters if necessary in the back end of your systems, but it's uh, almost never, ever, yeah. ever necessary. Yep. All right, so what we're going to do is we are going to add that album and context to this project. So I'm just going to add a new C Sharp class, and we're going to call it album.c Sharp. And I'm going to do, in this class, uh, something I typically don't do, just for demo purposes, I'm going to paste the album and the context both into this class. And the framework is already in here because I chose the, um, the project template with identity. So entity framework is already here because identity uses that. We're just going to add the reference here for system.data.entity. Compile it. Very important to compile it. <laughs> yes, make sure <laughs> I, the number of times. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we've got our album and our context. What can we do with that at this point in time? So with MVC, we can actually do something really cool where we can get access to edit this data and view this data uh, in seconds. So all you do is we're going to right click on our controllers folder. Let's run this as it is because we have, this is just our basic MVC template. What I'm showing you right here has nothing to do so far with any framework. This is just a basic MVC template right now. We can log in, which uses any framework behind the scenes for identity, but not for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Entity framework uh, with identity, identity has its own context that's installed in your application uh, as part of the template. We're not touching any of that. We're only worried about our code right here. So watch our code. Our code. Watch this. We're going to add new scaffolded item. And we're going to select the option here, an MVC5 controller with views using entity framework. That sounds wonderful to me. So add that. What model class would you like us to scaffold? So scaffolding basically looks at an entity, that album class, and gives you all the HTML and code to be able to list them all, to edit them, to delete them, to create new ones. Very, very cool. So our entity, our model that we want to use is our album class. Our context, our database context, DB context class we're going to use, there's the one that's used by identity. It's called application DB mm -hmm. context. And here's ours, music context. And there's also a plus sign there. So you could actually get Visual Studio to create it for you. Um, and it will create it by using code. So it's not like doing a designer. You can actually see and modify what it created. That's right. Uh, if you do it, so we've done nothing so far with a connection string. Again, I'll talk about that next. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we've done nothing with a connection string. If you do this option here, it will give you a connection string and your yep. application configure in your web config. Uh, I'm going to cancel that and just use the one that we've got here so far. So that'll lead us into what we're going to talk about next. Add that. There we go. So we've got this albums controller, an index method, detail method, create. There we go. So create, uh, delete, details, edit, and index. Let's go ahead and run this. All we did was use our two classes and scaffold them out. Our context, our album, and scaffold them. If I go to album, I should say albums. This is already querying our database and that it created for us on the fly to say, all right, what albums do you have in here? We don't have any. Let's create a new one. And we're going to call this Wish. Because it's a new database. Brand new database. Created yep. our database for us. We don't have to do that. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that next. We just created. I mean, how easy is this? We can now edit this, or we can go to, let's go back, we can go to a read-only view, or we can go back and we can delete this. So that's what scaffolding is. Um, working with any framework, it, literally in seconds, you can come up with all the web pages you need for so many common business scenarios to uh, create, to all the CRUD uh, operations to create and edit your data. Super, super, super simple, right? Easy yep. so far? Yep. All right. So let's move on a little bit here. 
how does Entity Framework connect your database? I didn't use a connection string. Which, yeah, where is that database? <laughs> where is it? That database, your database could be in the cloud. It could be, uh, if anybody remembers the app underscore data folder, which still exists in the web templates. It um, could be locally on your intranet, SQL Server running over uh, in your data center. It could be on the internet. It could be some other folder on your system. So your databases can be in many different places. So the way that Entity Framework is going to check is it's going to say, hey, uh, do you have a connection string, um, a name of it? So in our web config or application config file, if anybody has seen the connection strings element there, there's a name. We add a connection string, we give it a name, um, my dev database or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So Entity Framework will actually look at that. It'll look in your config for a connection string called music store connection. If it finds that, Simply enough, it's going to read that connection string. It's going to open the connection to the database. If it doesn't find one, next it's going to use the actual name of your context class. So in our case, music context or music store context, it's going to use the actual name of your class and look inside of your web config for a connection string name net. Mm -hmm. If it finds that, OK, it's going to read that in. And same thing that we did before, it's going to read that connection string and open the connection to the database. All right, so far it hasn't found anything. We don't have a connection string named. We don't have anything in our web config, which is, uh, fits the scenarios we've done so far. Mm -hmm. So first it's going to do is going to um, look for SQL Express on your local system. If it doesn't find SQL Express, it's going to look for LocalDB version 11. If it doesn't find LocalDB version 11, it's going to look for LocalDB version 12, which is no longer called uh, version 11. <laughs> I should have actually had I should actually have a, a v11.0 here. And here, it's uh, going to look for LocalDB slash uh, MS SQL LocalDB. So that is version 12. They changed the name of that in version 12. So what happened in our case was we didn't have a connection string named. So Entity Framework looked for all these settings here, and it basically said, oh, I don't see that you have one. So let's look on your system. Let's find SQL Express. Let's for, look for LocalDB version 11, uh, LocalDB version 12. And when we find LocalDB, Let's go ahead and create a database. Perfect. <laughs> That's the default behavior, which you're going to talk about more about how uh, those databases get created. As you'll best talk about how to actually manage the databases, we change our classes as well. Yep. Yep. Um, here's a little bit of advice here. If you, you should always specify a connection string name when you intend to use a connection string in the config file. That's a very important point there. Um, you're expressing intent. Right now, you might run these projects and be like, where, how is Entity Framework creating a database from where? I haven't specified where it is. So uh, if you know which database you want to use, and you're not going to just do this on the fly like this, it's best to specify that connection string name, which was like this right here. Specify the connection string name in your context class, just right inside the constructor here. And this is the name it's going to look for in your config file. Best to specify that if you know you want to use that. If you don't, you don't care where it creates it, no problem. All right, so moving forward here, helpful hint, connecting to LocalDB, be aware of what's on your system. So you could have version 11 on your system, you could have version 12 on your system. What do you use when you connect to that database? When you're in Visual Studio and you want to connect to your local database, you use this string here, parentheses LocalDB slash MS SQL LocalDB or slash v11 or v11.0. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what versions are installed in your system, you can do this uh, SQL local DB I or V. You can do this inside the PowerShell console, I believe here, the package manager console, since it is PowerShell. SQL local DB I, SQL local DB V, or just go to a console command line here, SQL local DB I, SQL local DB V. So one of these here gives you the versions installed, SQL Server 2012, and it says that's 11, SQL Server 2014, that's version 12. Uh, SQL local DB I returns MS SQL local DB and v11.0. So we can see what's on the system right here. Real simple way to do it. Viewing queries. So it's always, for me, I like to know how things work. It's good to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Yep. Uh, Entity Framework makes it really easy to hook into those queries. Again, if you don't have IntelliTrace on the ultimate version, this is a super simple way to do it. You uh, specify database.log and where you want that output to go, debug.writeline or console.writeline. Another way is Glimpse. I'll show you that in web application. Glimpse is one of my favorite tools. It is a free tool that you can use. 
And last, you can do an interceptor that goes inside your uh, config file in the Enderly Framework section. And you can specify an output file, and it will take all of those SQL statements, all those status messages, and log them out to this log file here. Let's look at using a couple of these here. Let's take, in our web application, let's go back to our context class. Let's create a constructor here. Public music context. Debug, which we're going to have to add in here, the system.diagnostics. So we're saying our debug window is where we want to log all of our SQL statements to. So let's go ahead and run this. Go back to our albums page. And here's our debug output window. So debug windows, if you don't see it, debug windows output. And let's scroll up just a little bit here. Way up. All right. Open connection. We can see Enderly Framework's doing a little bit of querying in the beginning here. Um, here's another query here. All of its status messages, another query. So we can see everything that's going on. That's one way of doing it. You have to go back and check this here, which implies you're running the debugger. Maybe you're not always running in the debugger and you want to view these statements. So another thing that I like to do here is use Glimpse. So for that, let's go ahead and go to our package manager console, install dash package glimpse.mvc5. So we're going to install two packages, glimpse.mvc5 and glimpse.entityframework6. So one integrates with MVC. If you're doing MVC development, I consider this package essential. And I'll show you why in a second here. <laughs> install dash package glimpse.ef6. That's going to install the support to hook into Enderly Framework 6. So let's go ahead and F5 to run this application again. All right, so let's go back to slash glimpse.axd to turn glimpse on. So glimpse.axd. Get this nice screen here with this big button click, turn glimpse on. Okay, Glimpse is set to on. Oops, let's go right back here like this to albums. Now you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner when my albums comes up here, this little window that's docked down at the bottom here. Just click on this G, and it shows you just like the developer tools show up. However, this is not a plugin into the browser. Uh, this is client side, but it's using information that was hooked throughout your whole life cycle of your request. So in here, if you're doing MVC work, you can see which routes uh, ended up getting to your page, how the execution happens, cool. uh, if you want to see a timeline of everything on here. But since we are talking about any framework here today, let's go ahead and look at the SQL that actually was executed. Let's make this a little bit bigger here. And we can see what's going on here. Uh, Entity Framework does some startup. Let's uh, control plus, control plus a little bit. Entity Framework does some startup here. So some startup code. Startup code. We'll talk about what this migration history is a little bit later. And then after it's done its startup code here, when we look for the albums, we can see that's what's happening right here. So select album ID, title, and price from albums. Let's make this a little bit smaller and come back here. And let's create a new album. And we'll call this Wish 2. <laughs> 995 will make this one, and we'll create it. <laughs> OK, I'm going to keep using that same name over and over <laughs> and over again. Let's F5 this, and let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. There's our albums query. Let's get a little bit more specific. Let's go into edit this album. And now we can see here, select where albums, where ID is equal to 2, because that's the one that we clicked on. If we look on our query string up here, slash edit slash 2, where 2 happens to be the ID, uh, the ID of the element that we're editing. In other words, it's album's uh, primary key is equal to 2. So we can see all these queries here. All sorts of other really neat information you can view through Glimpse. But I just wanted to show you this is another really cool way. Because you can deploy your application locally. Uh, but by default, this is turned off in production, of course. And uh, you can view what your queries are. So this is a great development tool. OK. 
Pretty cool? Yeah. Pretty cool. So again, review, we can do database.log. Uh, you can do this in your uh, context class in the constructor. If so, like we did it, you don't need context dot. Glimpse, install package, glimpse MVC5 and EF6. Or you can use interceptors, which is just a block of uh, XML that goes inside of your config file. We looked at a demo of viewing those queries and connection information. Mm -hmm. You can also view inside of that as well. So if I want to come over here, I'll just paste this in. Let's go back to our console application here. If we want to view our connection information, we can simply do it like this. Console.writeline, context.database.connection. That's what it's using behind the scenes. If anybody's worked with ADO.net, you have a SQL connection. So this is going to write out the connection stream for it. So let's F5 that. Go back to this window here, and we can see right here, this is where any framework is looking. So we talked about it looks for SQL Express first, version 11, version 12, and we can see that it found uh, version 12 on this system here. Actually, I'm sorry, it's SQL Express version 12, and then version 11 is technically the order it looks in. The, uh, the higher, the later version takes precedence. So we found uh, SQL Express version 12 here, mm -hmm. which goes by slash MS SQL local DB. And there we go. That's a, that's a connection it's using. It created our database, uh, which goes by default, which you'll talk about next. Yep. And the world is a happy place. Now let's talk real briefly about generating any framework classes. Do it. <laughs> we can hand code a class. So that's what we looked at with Alum. We can just mm -hmm. write a real simple class there. There is a visual designer that you can use. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that today specifically because uh, it was announced that in any framework 7, the visual designer is is going the way of the dodo bird. Well, that's it, it, that's a good thing. It's going bye bye. You know, it's it was a little weird to use. I like using code. That was an XML format. Sometimes, you know, you had issues as you were trying to figure out how that was mapping over to what you wanted to do in code. Um, sometimes the designer supported things that code didn't, and vice versa. So it's good that we're just going to have one single approach to use now where we just have code and it works that way. Um, so if you're saying, well, what about these existing databases I want to use? So let's go ahead and look at a way of using. A lot of people have asked, yeah, what about an existing database? How to use database? an existing database? Yeah. We're going to look at this. Um, we're going to look at this twice today. So we'll just we'll talk about the procedure real quick now, and we're going to look at it again uh, a little bit later. OK. Um, Let's go back to our web application here. And I'm going to just take, um, take one of these databases that exists on this system here. Let's find one that's got some data here. OK. So I'm going to take just any of these instances here. And I'm going to look at the um, connection string for this. And this is MS SQL local DB. So let's go back to my console app. And let's go ahead and reverse engineer some existing database. And the way that we do that is we right click and we're going to add a new item to our project. So add new item. We're going to add a new data item. ADO.NET Entity Data Model, which is going to do a bunch of things. Whatever you want to call your context class, we'll call it music context. I'll call it reverse. This is the one that we're reverse engineering from database. So we add that, and we get this little pop-up that comes up here. Um, again, we're not going to talk about the designer, but the option is here because this is Entity Framework 6, not 7. So Entity Framework designer from database, empty designer model, empty code first model. No, I want a code first model from a database. So I choose that one. I go no next. No designer. No designer. Says, all right, what do you want to use? Um, we can use one of these ex existing connections, or let's go ahead and connect to local DB slash ms sql local db. And that should show us a whole bunch of things that are for local db on the system. I'll just choose one of them here and say OK. So we can see now we're using ms sql local db. Uh, this is the one that we just chose from Web Application 5. So it's, we're in our console app, and we chose another app's uh, database here. Choose next. This is a real simple database, but the, op the same option applies to more complex database. We see our uh, tables here. I'm just going to choose albums. We don't want migration history. We're going to be talking about what that is a little bit later, though. We choose albums, finish, and there we have it. It's created our music context reversed. It has albums in it. We, oops. 
not anything in the middle of ALBUM. <laughs> Cannot navigate the bum. That was kind of funny. <laughs> and down here, let's look at the class that it created for us. When I navigated to definition, if you caught that there, I F12'd on this. In other words, if I right click and I say go to definition or press F12, at the bottom here it said, hey, we see that there's two albums in there. The one that you initially created here, that was the one I copy and pasted, or the one that we just reverse engineered from your database. So that's it. Simple as that. Uh, we point it to a database and it creates the classes for us. And we're going to look uh, as later on uh, some of these other attributes and things that make this a little bit more complicated because this is just a very, very simple case. Couple resources here. Uh, Enemy Framework resources. This is a great general site to go. And the Enemy Framework team blog, where they're always talking about new things with version uh, six and with the upcoming version seven. We're going to get to version seven at the very, very, very end, though. Yep. Um, so, Christopher, I think uh, you'll be taken away on this next module here. Yeah. Stick around, yeah. and we'll uh, see you very shortly. Yeah, we'll see you guys back here in 10. Take care.